Once again, welcome to week three of our study of the book of Jonah entitled Mad at God. How many of you have ever had a come to Jesus moment? Like that moment where you realized that you were headed in the, the wrong direction? Uh, that, that moment you understood, the light bulb went on, that you were getting nowhere with the, the path that you were on? That moment where you realized that, that if your mom found out, maybe that when your mom did find out that, that your heart was broken because of the, the hurt you caused? Like, how many of you have experienced a moment like that or moments like that, if you're old enough uh, to have experienced more than, than one in your life? A moment where you realize, I'm walking down the path, this is where I'm headed in life, the light bulb goes on, whether maybe through someone else's words, maybe because of the word you've heard before, maybe because you sank so deep like Jonah that the light bulb goes on and you realize, I have to go in the opposite direction. How many of you have had a come to Jesus moment? Like, don't be ashamed to admit it. I've experienced multiple ones in my life. Or how many of you have actually received an invitation to a come to Jesus meeting? <laughs> like the light bulb didn't go on. Something happened. Maybe you ended up in the hospital because of a choice that you made. You realized, I don't want to be here. I got to do something different. No, how many of you had to have the light bulb go on because someone had to actually call a meeting and have a conversation? Like it got so bad and you were so far down the road that, that you couldn't see it and in order for there to be a change, they, they had to call you in. They had to have the conversation. There have been times in my life when I've been on both sides of the invitation. I've extended them <laughs> and I have also been invited to them. Like that's where we find ourselves in in Jonah right now. I want you to have that in your mind. I want you to have that on your heart. We're going to see in chapter 3 a come to Jesus moment and meeting that is going to take place. I, I want you to think about maybe how you've reacted or responded to it, how you would uh, or how you did when it happened. Because Jonah literally had a come to Jesus moment, <laughs> right? He's He's on the ship going the wrong direction, gets thrown overboard. He's sinking down. He doesn't die as he's going down to the, uh, the, the bottom. He gets swallowed by a fish. Three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. Him and God, him and Jesus, he's pushing, he's praying, he's talking to God, or having a come to Jesus meeting. So Jonah kind of got both all at the same time. <laughs> the moment led to the meeting in the fish. And chapter two leads us uh, to what happened as a result. Jonah, from the belly of the fish, he pushed. He didn't blame God. He, he didn't point the finger at others uh, while he wrestled with himself. He didn't get overwhelmed and get paralyzed. But in that moment, he responded to it by praying until something happens and something did. The Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Like we see the results of the moment and the meeting. Jonah ends up breathing outside of the belly of the fish on the seashore, perhaps half covered in fish bile and fish guts, but no doubt rejoicing because his life had been spared, he had been given a second chance to literally live. And that's what chapter three gives us the opportunity to investigate. A truth that I kind of believe it is a reality when you've had a come to Jesus moment or a come to Jesus meeting. Like I've actually used this phrase with people in my life, people that I'm close to, when it comes to those moments when you realize I've gone down the wrong path and something needs to change, some powerful and important words are this. God will not, people, excuse me, people will not judge you based on what you did as much as they will based on how you respond. Like, what you did could have been big and bad, but in that moment when you have the come to Jesus moment in the meeting, what you did will be less memorable than how you respond. Like, did you learn from it? Did you actually change? Did you actually do something differently? Or was the moment only a moment, and was the meeting 
not worth it. So how did Jonah respond? How did God respond? And chapter 3 gives us insight as Jonah is there on the seashore, maybe considering what's next, thinking about where should I go, what should I do, we see what God does. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Remember time one, he called him to go to Nineveh, Jonah ran the opposite direction. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I gave you. Go to it, what I told you to do before, I want you to do now. God gave Jonah a second chance. And while I love it, there's a part of me that wrestles with it. Like you see God and all he's doing along the way. You see God being generous with with grace to Jonah and sparing his life. You see God using discipline in a loving way to wake him up so that he has the moment, uh, so that the meeting uh, that, that, that takes place in the belly of the fish where God's on, at work on his heart and Jonah is talking to God, all those things happen. Like I, I love all those things, but I don't know about you, but if I was God... I'm not so sure I would have asked him to go <laughs> after the first time. I'm like, you want to entrust something that important to that kind of person? <laughs> like, he literally went in the opposite direction of God. When the storm is raging, he doesn't confess his sins. He doesn't call on God for mercy to stop the storm. He says, no, what will stop the storm is you putting me in the ocean. Like it's only as the seaweed is wrapping around his head as he's sinking down, but God, the light bulb, the moment happens. And that's, that's not how God operates, and I want you to see that. It plays out in the story of chapter 3 as well. It's actually very biblical of God. Like this is what God does. He's a God of second chances, even to some of the most... <laughs> shall we say, horrible moments that take place in people's lives when they don't do it God's way. Like the God of second chances gave a second chance to the deceiver that was known as Jacob. Like God literally told Jacob, you're going to be the one who's going to get the promise. You're going to be the one who the Savior and the family tree is going to be uh, a part of. And, And yet Jacob took it into his own hands, deceived his dad, ripped off his brother, and then had to run for his life. And And yet later, when God is wrestling with him, God renames him to Israel, (laughs) the one who is the the father of the 12 tribes of God's people, of the tribe of Judah, which eventually was the the tribe through which Jesus came. Or how about one of Jesus' own, Peter? I will never run from you. I I will never deny you. I, I will go down swinging for you, Jesus. But when push came to shove, when the pressure was upon him, when when he feared for his life, Peter was quick to deny three times before the rooster crowed, as Jesus predicted. And yet a few weeks later, after his resurrection, Jesus has a one-on-one, a come-to-Jesus meeting and moment with Peter and reinstates him, and he becomes the leader of the early Christian church. God is a God of second chances. Or how about Saul, renamed Paul, the the one who took great pleasure in persecuting and and Christians dying, has a come-to-Jesus moment and meeting, literally on the road to Damascus, and the life direction that, that he was on goes 180 degrees in the other direction, and he goes from being one of the greatest persecutors of Christians to the greatest missionary and lover of Jesus Christ the world has ever seen. Like, this is how God operates If you might have any doubt or questions why God would give Jonah a second chance, this is what he does. It's who he is. That's how he responds. Now, you might know the story, but in that moment, what Jonah had done in the come to Jesus meeting that he had had, how would Jonah now respond to this opportunity? Verse 3 says this, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Like he didn't barter with God. He didn't have a around the, the, the fire moment like Moses questioning God or questioning himself. I don't know if I can do it. No, he simply obeyed and went. This time he responded differently. 
the meeting he had had with God, the, the work that God was doing on his heart, the loving discipline that God showed him, put Jonah in a different direction. He obeyed and he went. He responded differently. I mean, praise God for the work that he had done on Jonah's heart. Praise God for the grace that he had shown Jonah and giving him a second chance to do the, the job that he had called him to do, to go and preach in Nineveh, and Jonah did. But now Jonah has like about 25 days, if even the shortest amount of math, the 300 plus miles that the nearest seashore would have had for him to walk from where he was to Nineveh. <laughs> so he had a lot of time to ponder and, and think about God's grace. He had a lot of time to think about the, the sermon that he was going to give as he got to Nineveh. Like just imagine if I got 25 days, it would be more than 35 minutes this morning. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> it's not, that's not how you're supposed to respond. Jonah obeyed and he went. And I'm partly guessing that each and every day he celebrated the amazing grace of God that gave him a second chance. And yet, I'm guessing there was a little bit of anxiety, some wrestling that he was doing in his heart, maybe talking as he was walking along the road out loud about the Ninevites, how would they be re receive him, uh, how he might be scared about what he was about to encounter. I mean, the city was a powerful city. The city was a heathen city. This city was known for its wickedness, uh, for being willing to kill and chop off heads and put them on stakes of anyone who opposed them. That's the kind of place he's going. So what would Jonah do with all that time as he was walking, and then what would Jonah do when he got there? He obeyed. He did it. Nineveh was a very large city. Literally, when you look at the text, it was, Nineveh was a great, great city. So the NIV translates it in a way that you could. It was big, very populated. It was no doubt that. But maybe just as likely, or part of the explanation is what what is being described to us here is that the city of Nineveh was a great, great city in, in every way possible. Like culturally, it was a great, great city. It was looked to as like on the leading edge of culture in its day and age. Like if you think of New York from theater to fashion shows to, to architecture to everything else, like that kind of city. It was known for, for its status in the world of uh, of beauty and, and, and parks and, and, and all sorts of things that would make it stand out. It was a great, great city, not just in population, but in every way possible. And it took three days to go through it. That's probably not the best, uh, if you have in your mind, it took Jonah three days to go from point A to crisscross the city. It was probably not that big, Nineveh itself, even though it was a great, great city. It, it might be descriptive of Nineveh and its surrounding area, its suburbs. So if I started here in Freedom and I started out on a day's walk and I, I kind of wanted to walk, or if you think of the valley in and of itself from Green Bay down to maybe Fond du Lac, uh, that extensive of a, of a surrounding and community of Nineveh could have been three days. More likely what it's saying is it was a three-day journey for Jonah to hit all of the different pockets and areas like in Appleton, you think of the different areas where you live. You live by a certain park. You call yourself by that neighborhood. If you have ever been to the city of Chicago, there, you live in Chicago, but there are like 26 neighborhoods that are Chicago. Like it would have taken three days for Jonah to get to each and every bit and part of Nineveh. So the message got circulated throughout. In other words, what is being described is God made sure and Jonah understood to, to crisscross the city and hit every part of it so no one could have an excuse that they didn't get the message. And Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Like it's a summary of Jonah's message. It's not the only message he gave. Like I'm pretty sure he just didn't walk up to random strangers and say, hey, you two, 40 more days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Like, I think there was more of a little bit about God, who he is, a little bit about God, what he expects, a little bit about them and what they were doing, and a little bit about the reality of all those who sin against God are worthy of being condemned. And if you do not repent, if you do not believe in God, the city of Nineveh, you and your family and all of you will be overthrown. Like, God can do this. History proves it. This is what God has called you to do. Like, I'm guessing Jonah's message was filled with a whole lot of what we call 200-proof truth, which is the law. 
But even in that summary of the message, you also find 200 proof grace. Do you see what Jonah's message included? God is giving you, city of Nineveh, a time of grace. 40 days. 40 days to think about your sin. 40 days to repent of your wickedness. 40 days to turn to God. 40 days to, to ponder and think about the idols that you have, the sins that you have committed, and believe in the one true God of heaven and earth who can wipe you out, the one true God alone who can save you from the wickedness that you have committed. Like just the very fact that God was giving this wicked heathen nation and, and city 40 days was 200 proof grace. And God does the same for you and me. Like, where do you see yourself in the story of Nineveh? Like, Pastor Tim usually doesn't come knocking on doors and have a call, a come to Jesus meeting and, and, and literally tell you, like, three days or else, like, we'll talk about sin, we'll deal with sin, but we don't have these specifics from God that Jonah did, but, but we all have a time of grace when, from when we take our first breath to when we breathe our last breath that God allows us opportunities to, to have come to Jesus moments. And we all need them because we're all sinful. And before that last breath gets taken, having our relationship with God in the right place is vital and essential. And so what happened? Like, we've seen how God responded to Jonah's sin. He, he, he disciplined him, but he showered him with grace. We see now how Jonah responded to the second chance that God gave him. He, he went, he preached a bold message, a, a strong message, a true and proof grace and truth message. How did the Ninevites respond to that message of their wickedness? They believed God. A fast was proclaimed, they stopped eating, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, so this just wasn't a, a rich thing or a poor thing, this was an everybody thing, no matter what your status in this great, great city, from rich to poor, great, greatest to least, they put on sackcloth, every last one. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust, a sign of grief, a sign of mourning, a sign of sadness. If you remember our story on the book of Job last year, that's what Job and his friends did in the midst of the pain and the loss. There was sackcloth, there were ashes. Uh, this is the proclamation issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. The ruler said, change your ways. Let everyone call on God. Ask God for mercy. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. We need to correct our behavior, our wickedness. The message Jonah preached hit them in the heart. They understood the truth. They acted and responded. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. What did the Ninevites do with the chance that God gave them? How did the Ninevites respond to the message that God sent to them? All those words that you just heard read, I would say actually describe one of the greatest miracles in all of the Bible. Like the book of Jonah itself is littered with miracles. Like chapter one, God causes a great storm. Chapter one, Jonah happens to draw the lot and gets identified as the reason for the storm. Jonah gets thrown in the water and God stills the storm. Jonah doesn't die as he drowns. God keeps him alive and sends a fish to swallow him up, one that doesn't chew him or eat him, but, but saves him. And, and then God causes the fish to vomit him out. We're gonna see more miracles in chapter four. So many miracles, but the greatest miracle in the book of Jonah is that an entire city, perhaps of 500,000 people, from greatest to least, drops down to their knees, hears the message that God sent and repents of their sins, literally summed up in, in that first verse, the half of verse five, the Ninevites believed God. They believed. Like faith is a miracle of, that only God can do. 
Experts believe probably at this time there were upwards of at least half a million people in Nineveh, greater Nineveh. Like, just think about that. I'm, I'm not saying every last heart was converted, but a majority of them were, if, and the Bible's very clear on, everyone uh, acted, I mean, a great majority. This would be like six Appletons repenting, believing in God. <laughs> Could you fathom that? Like, I would retire from the ministry a day after that if that was my last sermon. Like, amen, God, close the books, call me home. We're all good. <laughs> like, half a million people. <laughs> like, I'm happy if two of you leave and go, Pastor, that really hit me in the heart. I need to work on that. Okay, amen. Like, we think we're a big church, 3,000 people, half a million people. Repented. believed in God, came to faith in, in God and turned from their sin and trusted in their Savior. Don't let that be forgotten in the story of Jonah. Like, great fish. Pastor Tim talked about bile and guts as he came out. Like, yeah, that's cool. That's great. Hundreds of thousands of people were saved. Praise God. Which is probably why it would be good for us to stop and see one of the things that transpires in the book of Jonah that's vital and important for, for people of God who believe in God to understand about their life of faith. It's a life of repentance. Like we've all been given a time of grace to get our relationship with God right. Like praise God that he's created faith in your heart and mine, that he's called us to believe. But even in our life of faith, you know why we do words of sin and grace every week? Not because we want to bore you, not because we want to make you feel bad, but because we want to give you an opportunity to be in the right place with God. Like, what is it that took place this last week that you need to bring to God? What's going on in your life right now that is wicked in the eyes of God that you need to turn from, that God's word needs to call you from? Like, don't take it lightly. Don't just go through the motions, but, but understand what the Ninevites did, what God called them to do, what, is what God's called his people to do from the time of Adam and Eve to the, to the end of time. Stop sinning. Turn from your sin. Believe in God. He's the only solution and the only Savior. The Ninevites give us an example of what true repentance looks like, what biblical repentance uh, uh, repentance is. John the Baptist's message that you heard before is in keeping with this as well. He highlighted some of those things. Repent and believe the kingdom of heaven is near. What does a repentant heart look like? What is a crash course on it that the Ninevites can teach us all so that we can apply it to our life uh, and live it just like they did? Well, three, uh, four C's in the crash course on repentance. The first one is confession. Like biblical confession, R repentance is, is confession. Owning it, acknowledging it, in the sense, just like the Ninevites believed in God, they believed his message, they believed that they were wicked, they believed that they were wrong, they believed that they deserved punishment. Confession owns it, acknowledges it, admits what we deserve and understands it and, and confesses to God. Second, right alongside of confession is contrition. Like con true contrition and as a part of repentance, is sincere sorrow over sin. It breaks your heart because you've broken God's heart kind of sorrow. Like true contrition is, is not sincere sorrow over having gotten caught. True, true repentance that, and true contrition is sincere sorrow because what I did offends Almighty God and I've broken the heart of God. I might have hurt other people, but my sin ultimately is with God and that should break your heart. And it broke the Ninevites' heart. Like you can see they were truly sorry because they, they called on God. They, they confessed their sins. They, they put on sackcloth and ashes. Like you don't just do that uh, because you got called out. Like they literally lived it and wore it. Confession, contrition, and step three is probably one of the biggest differences when it comes to when someone has sinned and done something wrong, 
True biblical repentance involves confession, contrition, and change. Change. Like, owning it is one thing. Being really sorry for it is another thing. And true repentance is to do what the word repent literally means, to turn in a 180-degree direction. That come to Jesus moment, the light bulb has gone on. Maybe it's through the word that God sent through a pastor, through a teacher, through a family member, through a friend, where, where that message that was sent dropped you to your knees, you understood it broke the heart of God, and, and you made a promise, and you said, I need, to ch- I need to change, I need to go in the opposite direction, a 180 degree turn. Now this side of heaven, please understand, there, we will never reach perfection, but God calls for change of direction. Like true repentance is about the change of direction. What has God called me to do? How has God called me to live? When I fall and fail on that path, maybe when I I get lured in by that same sin, God willing, the light bulb goes on and true repentance again, daily repentance that Martin Luther describes. I, I confess the sin, I'm contrite for it, and I get back in the right direction. And I need some of you to hear this right now. You and God might not be good because this is not taking place. And it's a benefit of the story of Jonah for us to examine our own hearts and examine our lives. Is there something that needs to change? Like maybe it's the way in which you are behaving in your personal life. Maybe it's you're going down the path of of self-medicating and abusing something that you shouldn't do. Maybe it's an issue of lust that you have in your heart. Maybe it's in the relationship that you are currently carrying out. Like, look at God's word, the message that he has sent. And understand, God has given you a time of grace. Like, shall we go on sinning so that grace might increase? No, like, do not as a Christian, if you are a Christian, live in light of this fact that you just believe Jesus died, he paid for my sins, it doesn't matter what I do. Wake up. The Bible's filled with passages of wake-up calls. And you and I don't get this warning like, 40 days, you got some time. Like, you don't know when your time ends, when the time of grace is up. Today's the day for you and for me, if this is us, to have a come-to-Jesus moment. And I pray that God might use this conversation as a come-to-Jesus meeting to get in the right direction. Because the fourth part of repentance is calling upon God. A repentant person is one who believes God. A repentant person is one who is sorry for their sins. A repentant person is one who who changes their actions and and path. And a repentant person is one who calls upon God for compassion because only God can rescue and deliver ultimately from sin and what we deserve. And the Ninevites modeled all of that. The Bible teaches all of that. God calls you and me to faith. He's given us the greatest of all miracles personally, but he's also put in front of us the greatest plan, a crash course in through the Ninevites of what it looks like to live the Christian life. We will never be perfect this side of heaven, but God wants us walking in the right direction, a daily life of repentance. It's why we do it weekly here in church, why beginning each day in your home might be a great thing to do, to own your sin, to talk to God, to give it to God, to call on God to help you get in the right direction, to give you the strength and guidance you need. Lord, where would you have me go? Like repentance on a daily basis is a huge blessing because you know where it ultimately takes you? The only place where sin and wickedness can be reconciled, the cross of Jesus Christ. The Ninevites responded, and you know how God responded to their repentance? It's an amazing verse. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Like God does not change his mind, the Bible says, but God is entitled to a change of paths. (laughs) In this case, he, he changed paths. He relented because they repented. The, the word worked on their hearts. They came to faith in Jesus. They understood God was God. And they believed in him as the only one who could save. And praise God he's done the same thing for you and for me. 
You know what he says in his word about sin? The wages of sin is death. You and I deserve death. But you know what? God relented on you and me and the punishment we deserve because he changed course of action by sending his son into this world to pay the price that you and I couldn't pay. So when we sin, God is faithful and just and forgives us for all unrighteousness as we come to him, as we repent uh, in faith, trusting in Jesus, calling on him for mercy. The fact that he relented and, and put on Jesus what was deserved by us is yours and mine. The big takeaway from, Je- from Jonah chapter three, God relents when we repent through the word that is sent. Like you and I have been blessed through the word that is sent. You may have had a person, a parent, a friend, a pastor, a teacher who God used to have a come to Jesus meeting to cause the light bulb to go on in that come to Jesus moment. Perhaps today's the day, praise God. But celebrate this, God relents. Repentant Christians who in faith turn to God, own their sin, are sorry for their sin, turn in the right direction, And when they fall and fail, celebrate and know that they can turn back to God, call on God, and and work that process and those steps. God relents on you and me because of Jesus Christ. It's biblical. Like, God gives us all a time of grace. God longs for us to repent. It's a part of a life of faith. Look at 2 Peter when Christians were asking, why isn't Jesus coming back sooner? Why doesn't he end all this? Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repent. So what happened for Nineveh, what God wants for you, what God gave to Jonah, what, what, what John the Baptist was calling for people is the same that God wants for others in your life. Maybe you're the one who might need to call the, come to Jesus meeting. Maybe someone else might need to call on with you. Praise God, because in your time of grace, God wants you and me to come to repentance. He doesn't want any of us to perish. And as we do, Sometimes it's easy to think, how could God forgive me? Be overwhelmed with guilt or shame. Like a repentant heart as you bring those sins to God, it's hard because they're real, they're big, like they're ugly, it's wicked. King David, who was a guy who got a second chance, understood this. He said, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. God will not turn his back on you. God will not turn away from you, but God will welcome you with open arms, just like that prodigal son who got a second chance. This is how God responds to you and me, to repentant Christians. Your sins are forgiven. You have peace with God. Your sins have been washed away in the blood of Jesus. And oh, how I wish that was the end of the story. (laughs) Like the amazing miracle of the great, great city of Nineveh and all of them coming to believe in God. Like, that's how Hollywood movies end, right? Like, close the chapter, Jonah goes home, he tells everyone about it. Like, just think about that. If Jonah's Jonah's sermon was that short, if he could do that in one day, like if 40 days and then it will be destroyed, that short a sermon causes hundreds of thousands to believe, like, amen, like, praise God. Sadly, it's not. Because you know this side of heaven, sometimes we get in the right direction like Jonah did, he responded but there are bumps and detours on the road that lead us back to a bad place, mad with God place. So you've got to come back for week four to see how God continues to work. The main point of Jonah and sadly the issue that still remains in, in his heart, something all of us will probably struggle with, but for today, celebrate that God relents. That in Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven. That's how he loves all people. You, me, the Ninevites, Jonah. That's the God who loves and longs for all of us in our time of grace to celebrate it and live a life of repentance. Let's pray for that. Heavenly Father, today is a new day. I pray that today maybe this message that is sent works on the hearts of those of us here at 922. Like to to make sure our, our hearts and our lives and our relationship with you is in the right place. Like Lord, your, your two and approved truth calls it out. We need to turn from sin to True repentance involves confession, sincere sorrow, contrition, change, and and calling upon you for compassion because alone with you is mercy and grace. So Lord, work on our hearts, help us address the issues of our heart and come to you owning it, acknowledging it, sorry for it, and with your power, power, help, and strength changing it because we know that you've paid the ultimate price to rescue us from sin. You've relented from the punishment we deserve and offered us grace upon grace in Jesus.